Well, hello there, YouTube. So I'm a couple minutes late today. So uh, when I say 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do mean around 7 o'clock. So I usually set the streams for 7.15 to be exact, to give myself 15 minutes. But on occasion, I tend to lose track of time. In this case, I lost track of my photo reference, but I have found it. And today we are going to get into the drapery. So, I apologize for the delays. So, um, let's see which questions I missed. By the way, I have my chat right here, so I'll be able to see all of your questions a little bit more uh, easily. So, um, let's see. Emeno, Angela, Ingrid, Kathy, um, everyone that's here today. I'm going to start off with a glaze on the green area of the shirt. So I'm going to go with uh, Viridian. We're going to use a dark middle green. So I'm going to go with that one is Diaxazine Purple. So Diaxazine Purple, Viridian, Neo McGill Medium, a little bit of Indian Yellow. Some cadmium yellow. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, so that's pretty good. A little more medium. So this is essentially a glaze that I'm adding over a greenish, dark greenish glaze. It's a middle tone. And we're going to paint into this. So I'm actually going to add light into it and I'm going to add uh, dark values into it. So just Viridian, Dioxazine Purple, uh, a couple colors actually went into there. Um, so Viridian, Dioxazine Purple, Indian Yellow. Indian Yellow is a nice transparent one. Let's see if I missed anything. I think I missed a couple of comments. Hey Rose, don't worry I'm here. Sometimes I'm a little late but I'm here. Okay, make sure this doesn't freeze. So I thought when I drew this, there was an extension of the drapery down here, uh, but that's actually the shadow. It would be nice if it did have an extension there, but oh well. So this is a Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle. Size six. I have to add a little more of that color. I'm out of Indian yellow. So how's everyone doing today? It's been a couple days since I last I was last here. Once again, I'm using Neo McGilp. It's a moderately fast dryer, but it's not as fast drying as like a Liquin or, or Galkid or any of those. And I like Indian yellow because it's very transparent. It's actually a dark yellow. So I'm glazing all the way down here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the uh, folds for the clothing into this, into the glaze. So I use glazes very differently. Sometimes I'll just use a glaze to touch up a color. Other times I'll use a glaze to paint into, like this. Thanks, Rose. And remember, medium, medium is, you wanna use it when you know that you have enough paint on your canvas. For example, this is an oil primed linen and it's already got another painting underneath of it. So uh, that is of course thoroughly dry. So this has more than enough on it for me to do this. And I'm gonna paint into this and you're gonna, you're gonna see how I do that. So it's not like I'm gonna just glaze it 
with this dark green and then just leave it. I'm gonna add details into it. And we may actually throw in some of the background color today too. Hey Jim Adams. Okay, so now that I think I've covered enough of this dark, I just make sure that this is thin, as thin as I can make it. Okay, so that should be good. Next thing I'm gonna do is get another brush with a darker uh, value. I'm gonna start to draw in the folds. Now when we do drapery in the online classes, I uh, go in with uh, monochromatic underpainting almost always. So I actually don't use this uh, technique when I'm teaching because it, it's harder than working with a monochromatic. So if you are relatively new to painting, definitely build it up through a monochromatic. You won't regret it. Or if you've got some experience, say like a couple months or a year experience and you want to experiment, try this out. Uh, glaze the whole thing, a middle value, and then draw in the, the midtones. So for example, not the midtones, the shadows. I'm gonna try and raise the light on the camera just for this section. So you can see the lines, they're very faint. I'm using just ultramarine blue. So I'm drawing in the shadow shapes with this. And then we may get into some portrait refinements later, depending on how far we get with the drapery. So just ultramarine blue mixed into that color that we already had. Follow the folds very carefully. And I like to think of abstract shapes while I am drawing in these folds. And I always tell my students to look for the, uh, the tension in each fold when you're doing uh, when you're painting drapery so not just copying the fold but what's causing the fold to uh, to look the way it looks so where's the point of tension so uh, tension is where, where is it pulling and in this case this is the sleeve and there's a, a gravity pulling this way technically speaking gravity doesn't pull it Bushes, but you know what I mean. More of these folds. Uh, let's see. Hey, Arts 1618. Uh, no, I won't be doing a wipe away technique. I will be painting into the lights. I'll be painting the lights. I will be painting them opaque. Oh good, uh, canvas dancer. Uh, I'm glad that the uh, adjustment to my camera makes it easier for you to see. I mean, of course it blasts the values on the lights, but you, what you need to see is this portion of it, so I'm glad that it helps. So where is the point of tension here? And that's actually coming from this area. So where is the tension coming from for each fold? So there's a little stitching here. As she's tucking in her arm, it's tucking away here and creating this pull. This is one of those instances where I will say it's actually easier to do this from a picture than from a live model. 
The problem with the live model with these poses is um, that the folds are never in the right spot, almost ever in the right spot. Um, and so in the past, what, what uh, artists did was they would have mannequins. And I'm sure many of you already know this. Um, Velasquez would have mannequins, uh, Van Dyck had mannequins, like all, all of them. I think Sargent had mannequins in his studio. And what you would do is if you get a portrait commission, if you land a portrait commission and there's like a really elaborate dress or something in there, you have to make sure that the mannequin, uh, the mannequin fits the proportions of the model of the uh, sitter. Now where is this, where's the point of tension for this shadow coming from? And, and that's, there's not really much of a point of tension for this. This is actually uh, just hanging out. This is a piece of the dress that's been pulled down. Yeah, how uh, velvet is portrayed. That velvety clothing is always pretty fun to paint, I will say. Um, it, it all depends on the, the values and the textures. Okay, there's a cast shadow right on her waist over here. And notice I'm making all the shadows the same color. Uh, and that's because I'm drawing them in with color. But later, if I want, probably not the day, but at some point I will vary the color. Might even get to it today, I'm not sure. Angela. If the glaze is already dry, I suppose it would be more difficult to paint the folds, I mean, the darks and lighter areas. Um, yes, so, um, Angela, this is the reverse of the uh, way that I taught us to do the drapery with Artemisia. This is backwards, uh, because I'm starting off with a glaze. While the painting is still wet, I'm going to build the folds onto this. Where, whereas with the Artemisia, we worked wet over dry because the folds for the underpainting were already dry and then we glazed the color onto that which created uh, this effect. Uh, so this is the reverse. Um, and no, I wouldn't be able to do this method if I let this glaze dry. I, I wouldn't be able to. It has to be wet for this to work. Okay, and over here, it's not a fold but a little decorative piece over here, which as I squint down, this whole thing is a little darker, so we're just going to scrub that in there for now. Different uh, pressure gives me a different value. See that little trick there? So it's not quite as dark as the surrounding folds. Oh, thanks, uh, Para Stu. All right, so now uh, let's draw in some of the little details for the stitching. I think that's what this is called. And this is a method of painting drapery that I kind of just figured out on, on the fly um, with this blue dress painting that I've been working on for a couple months now. I actually featured that blue dress painting in, a, in, a, in the background of a YouTube video a while ago. If you remember the blue dress painting, this is the same method I used for that one. I'm dry brushing into the skin tone. Oops. Okay. 
Okay. So now we get to go into some of the fun stuff. I mean, all of this is fun, but this is um, particularly going to be fun. So uh, I'm going to use a size 2 Robert Simmons Egbert. Size 2 Robert Simmons Egbert uh, bristle brush. And um, let's mix up a light green. I'm going to go with yellow ochre. Lead tin yellow. Because you've always got to throw lead tin yellow into the mix. Burnt sienna. It's looking more like a skin tone, but it's because I want the green to not be so bright. I'm going to throw in a bunch of colors into the mix. Cobalt blue. Now you see I'm using very opaque colors for this. Cadmium yellow. So try to be creative with your colors. Uh, don't just throw, for example, like a basic blue would be like cadmium yellow and cobalt blue. And it's just kind of boring to throw in a basic color like that. Make it interesting. You know I hate the word interesting, but uh, make it unconventional. Hey Paris, too, what's your advice for becoming a full-time artist? That is a big question. Um, big question indeed. Uh, my, my advice is to, number one, uh, spend a lot of time just creating art. Don't think about making a living from it. Um, spend a long time just uh, perfecting your, uh, your skills. And then um, what you want to do is present your work on social media. Try not to show, uh, you know, too many unfinished things on social media. Try to only show your best. For example, uh, this is not my best. This is me showing a demonstration, but it's a demonstration. It's a it's an unfinished painting, so I can kind of get away with um, showing this. So once you start to show your work, uh, the hard part really becomes differentiating yourself from the thousands of other, millions of other artists out there. And the good news is um, Paris Du and everyone that's wondering how to become a full-time artist is you don't have to work at being different from other people. You don't. You are naturally different from other people. Naturally different. Just like you and I have different handwriting. Um, it, we're naturally different. From one another uh, you know I, I'm not a clone of Sargent I am NOT a clone although sometimes I wish I was I'm not a clone of um, Nelson Shanks I am who I am I am me so the better I get at technique the better my own creativity the more my own creativity will show and the same will happen with you Think of this as a language. Think of painting as a language, learning how to speak a language. Uh, think of technique as a language. I've used this analogy before. Um, painting technique is nothing more than a language. The more you know about this language of how to paint, the more you will be able to express yourself, your inner art. Because all of us have something unique and wonderful that we can express but we need the tools to make the, those messages that we're trying to express uh, as clear as possible and if you love it you will emerge you will it's it's inevitable if this is your passion if this is what you love to do forget about what everyone else tells you that it's impossible or or, or it's you know the things that people have told me, you would wouldn't be maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but the things that people have told me, you will emerge. Ah, oh, thanks, uh, Ingrid. It's a tough question. I think about it all the time, though, so I, I was a little prepared for that. <laughs> Thankfully, I was prepared. 
Okay, so you can now see the difference between this spot and this. This is now almost a fully modeled area of the drapery. Now drapery, see if you can get away with the minimal effort in terms of values. Get away with what you can with drapery. Uh, the biggest problem with drapery is uh, putting too much and then it starts to look kind of fake. There's too much in it. Oh, minnow or learning to play an instrument. Yeah, I wouldn't, I don't know about <laughs> instruments. But I'm I'm supposing it's a similar path. All right, so this is starting to look like the drapery. And this gives me control over the edges. I can have sharp edges, I can have soft edges, I can have lost edges. So much control over the edges. Practice will create ability, I do believe that, uh, David. So, Canvas Dancer mentions a book. Do what you love, the money will follow. I was always afraid of that advice when I was younger. I was terrified of it. Because uh, that's what people would tell me uh, when I was just getting into art. But it's true, if you do have a passion for it. Uh, life has a funny way of kind of working itself out. Okay, so we've got our for, first little uh, robot program here. Oh, thanks, Canvas Dancer. All right, so don't worry about those uh, comments popping up on the chat. I'll take care of them now that I know what they are. Okay, that has been dealt with. So the trick with this is knowing the differences between the opacities in your paint. So remember I used cobalt blue and I used very uh, opaque, like th this puddle is super dense uh, compared to this one. So um, the light, even though this looks super dark here, uh, because obviously this is wood and this is not, um, the opacity is what helps me make this light look light. If this was a transparent light, it, it just wouldn't show well enough. So the stitching on here would take me probably the entire duration of this stream just to paint the stitching here. So I can't do that so I'm going to suggest it. I'm keeping you at a distance on purpose from the painting because I want you to see the painting as I'm seeing it. I am about an arm's length away from the painting. It's important that you stay as far back from your paintings as you possibly can. And because you can see me here, I sometimes like show up on the camera, uh, you can see how far I am. It's comfortable to be close, I, I admit, but um, it's much more beneficial for you to try to keep yourself at least an arm's length away from your painting. Uh, 
A comment from David Bonnet. Please describe the glaze. Uh, glaze is a semi-transparent application of oil paint um, where you can see the layer underneath of the color, kind of like a stained glass. Uh, that's what a glaze is. Uh, to put it simply, um, a glaze is just applying paint with medium on it. Uh, that's it. Uh, that's it. Um, and I use the glaze on here first to paint into. So this technique is very different from what you would see in a traditional glaze. So I didn't do much with the glaze. I just added it on here and then I painted directly into it. I'm painting directly into it. Alright, so we got another robot. Got two of them tonight already. I don't know why there's so many robots. All right. Second robot of the night has been taken care of. So depending on how I apply this dark value, if I put less pressure, I can have uh, a lighter touch. Neil McGill starts to get tacky or um, settle into the canvas after about maybe an hour. So it gives me just enough time. And even if it is tacky after an hour, if I'm still working on this after an hour, I can still paint into it. It won't be dry dry until maybe like two days from now. So I've got time. Yep, just a very thin layer. Yep, that's correct. And another thing you will notice with drapery, in a lot of uh, paintings uh, of painters that don't have a lot of experience with drapery, you will see symmetry imposed into the drapery. And uh, sometimes that is the case. Sometimes symmetry is actually in the drapery. And if it is, you should probably adjust your setup. But uh, for example, this big fold over here, if I put a perfect fold right here, perfectly following this, that would be a forced symmetry onto the drapery. And if I force symmetry onto it, it's, it's just human nature to try to seek out symmetry. Uh, but drapery is usually asymmetrical. So um, an inexperienced uh, uh, let's say a painter that puts drapery that has everything just uh, symmetrical like this line is here say this fold you know like the distance from this dark to this dark if it was symmetrical with this dark for example like if this light shape was the same as this or even if this one was the same as this one which they're not as you can see it would be imposed symmetry so if you want to make your drapery look more naturalistic, try to impose asymmetry. Do the opposite. Impose asymmetry onto your drapery. This is actually going to be a darker mid-tone. All right, so just like last time, we got into some very uh, fun conversation last time, uh, art-related, of course. And uh, I'm going to allow the viewers to uh, post your own question for the dialogue of this chat once again. So um, 
Uh, Ingrid, I know you're going to want to find something to write or to ask everyone. Or um, uh, Brenda, if Brenda's here. Um, what question would you like to ask the audience? It could be a repeat from last time. It's okay. Sometimes we have new viewers here. So go ahead and comment a question that is art related that you would like us to talk about together as I'm developing this uh, painting. And of course, if you have questions about how I'm developing this, I can always answer. Let's try to keep the chat uh, uh, fun, engaging, informative, all the positive attributes I can think of. Uh, another, another imposed symmetry. I almost did it here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. These four little zigzags look way too symmetrical. And on the reference, this one's actually taller. So break these asymmetry, or break the symmetry, impose asymmetry onto the drapery, and it'll look more natural. All right, we've got one from Minnow. So possibly each one of us can name one painting that is very dear to us so others can look it up on the internet. Good job, good job. All right, excellent. Um, Okay, let's let's do that. Let's um, make this a question for everyone. So everyone name one painting That is very dear to you and Share it here so others can look it up Awesome uh, For me um, There's so many paintings uh, What comes to mind is uh, This is a tough one It's tough because I know the paintings the, the way they look like. I just don't remember their names. Uh, let's think of. Ooh, this is a fun one. Uh, Gargoyle by Nelson Shanks. An interesting name. It's a figure painting with the pose is the model looking upwards uh, with very almost scary dramatic light. So, Gargoyle by Nelson Shanks. Lady with the pearl earring. Good one, good one. Uh, Ingrid, you've been painting for six years. Mariah, four years. Of course, uh, feel free to share how many years you've been painting. I'll answer that one. Uh, since 2009, 2008, 2009. So, um, well, I keep forgetting the math. So, um, that is about 13 years. So 13 for me. Jim Adams, about a month. Awesome. Welcome to painting. Birth of Venus, that's a good one. A good one. I think that one's by Botticelli. So Kathy, one year and 10 months. Oh, uh, did I miss a question? I think I did. Hold on a second. Let me check. Uh, so from Maria, did you sometimes add the reflected color into the peaks of folds or just use lighter version of the midtone color to mix? Uh, just a lighter version of the color. Uh, just a lighter version. But later on, I can come back to this and add reflective lights. Reflected or ref, uh, reflective lights. If I want to, um, I can come back and add that later. But it's just a lighter version of the same color. Looks like we're going to have to add more for the hair back here too.
So a question from Cal. What are you seeking to accomplish with art? So that is a question I think is uh, for everyone. So this is great. We have a nice uh, selection of questions now uh, that we can all talk about. So um, I'd say you can choose whichever you want to. Uh, Serenity by Jeremy Lipking. I know who Jeremy Lipking is, but I can't think of which one is Serenity. I'd have to look it up. So the questions that are floating around for all of us are uh, name a uh, painting that's uh, very uh, name a painting that you like and you want to share the name with everyone so we can look it up another one is um, name or tell us how long you've been painting and another one is what are you seeking to accomplish with art uh, for me what am I seeking to accomplish with art um, I'm kind of ambitious what I want to accomplish with art is I want to leave something behind in this world uh, that makes this world a better place through my art. That's what I want. And I'm just um, oversimplifying it. I want to be the very best painter I possibly can, but I also want to be able to share uh, my knowledge as I go. And also leaving behind uh, the best paintings I possibly can. So I want to make this world a better place with my painting. I, it's very ambitious. I don't know if I'll ever get there, but um, I'm going to try. So two years, Stephanie Thompson. Awesome. Welcome to painting. David Bonnet, the kiss from Frank Francisco Hayes. That's, I haven't. I, maybe I know that one. I'm not sure. And you can always replay the chat. Um, I discovered that when you rewatch this video, you can replay the chat. So if you miss anything, the chat replays. So Mr. Piano Lee, an experiment on a bird in an air pump? Am I reading that right? An experiment on a bird in an air pump by Joseph Wright, 1768. Oh wow, I gotta look that one up just by the name. <laughs> Sounds very, uh, very cool. I mean, I, I like, I like birds, don't get me wrong, but that sounds very, uh, um, different. And this technique, this method, is in fact how I paint a lot of things in my studio paintings. I'll actually glaze it dark and then paint into it. It's a very fast, somewhat risky in terms of you have to be very precise about your values. Uh, but it's very fast and effective. Hey Barbara, thank you. So we've got one from Menno, uh, Jared. Do the ast uh, let's see astronomist. That's cool. Gotta look that one up. All right, we've got another bot here. Third one of the night. Let's uh, let's see. Okay. So once again, don't worry about these uh the robots. I'll take care of them. Alright, so we got rid of that robot. Yep, I'll check it out. Uh, Mr. Piano Lee. Anything by Jeffrey Tay Larson. Alright, gotta check that out. Thanks for sharing that with everyone. So from Kathy, I want to be good enough to paint my daughter's portrait so they can keep uh, the family heirloom. I'd say you are well on your way to that, Kathy.
the water lily pond, green harmony by Monet. Gotta love Monet paintings. So I'm essentially paraphrasing the uh, drapery. I'm adding in only the, the motion of the folds of the drapery, but I'm not necessarily copying the exact patterns of the folds. So another good question from Ingrid, what lighting is everyone using in their studios? Good, good, good. I can answer that one. Um, I'm using an LED, so or uh, it's a newer, that is N E E W E R brand, um, N L six six zero, variable colored LED light. A good question for everyone. What lights are you using? All right, so let's paint the dark for the hair. Hey, Ronald, welcome. So from Cal, are you seeking beauty? Anything else uh, slash quality? So once again, this question is meant for everyone in the audience. And uh, Cal's first question was, what are you seeking uh, in your art? Now he has added to his question, are you seeking beauty? Anything else? Um, uh, and I, I can answer for me, it's not necessarily beauty that I'm seeking in art rather um, I'm seeking more of a, a visual poetry of sorts um, meaning I, I want my paintings to have depth to them uh, I want them to have a certain air of wonder but everyone is different and of course quality is what I'm after but there's something more, there's something beyond just quality though. Qu quality is something that we seek in the beginning and we're always seeking it. Uh, so I don't think anyone is painting and not thinking about quality. I mean, I could be wrong and I, I hope that I'm not wrong, but um, you know, I think quality is something that everyone is seeking. Unless you're like talking about like the difference between classical art and modern art and things like that which are <laughs> uh, probably not appropriate but we can get into that if you want it's not like uh, we'll get in too much trouble with that famous last words <laughs> Mr. Pianoli, uh, let's see soon to be using candlelight there's a huge storm on the way oh no not, not a storm, that's not good. Oh, why is my screen blue? Oh, thank you so much, Ronald Miller, for the super chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If I had confetti, I would throw the confetti up. Uh, thank you, Ronald Miller, you are uh, too kind to me. Thank you for the super chat. So, comment from uh, Paris to any hack for organizing little a little studio room. I have so many... Uh, so many uh, different things. Uh, let's see. My advice, because um, my studio space was smaller than this before, my advice would be to um, have a really good easel. 
um, because easels that are like um, you know like a mm, just have a really good easel that you can fit things on so for example uh, the setup that I have let's see if I can move this the setup that I have over here so my easel has got one of these things and I've got my table so uh, if you have a small studio your easel should have one of these things where you can or if you have a good easel it should have one of these things a studio easel um, have this and have a small table or a tabaret it's called something like this but that has compartments under here and you can store all your stuff there and uh, it really doesn't take up that much space. That would be my best advice for that. Uh, so from Kathy, uh, yeah, that's true. I do want to show harmony with animals and my paintings in it, but that, that's kind of com complicated. Uh, that would be very difficult for me to try to explain. Um, but um, yeah, please check out my artwork, everyone, on Instagram. Because what you're seeing here is more of a demonstration, but yet I'm still trying to make something, you know, um, aesthetically appealing out of this. But uh, check out my Instagram and you'll see exactly what Kathy means. I do put in animals and um, mainly reptiles in my paintings. And I, I want to show the, uh, um, you know, the beauty in that. Because you know that there's arachnophobia, uh, Ophidophobia, which is the fear of snakes. Herptophobia, the fear of reptiles. Um, you know, lots of phobias <laughs> that I'm trying to uh, show people that you don't need to have those phobias. Another one from Paris to you seek meaning in art. Uh, Menno, sorry to cheat my second painting. Mondarian, the great tree, no problem. The bird in the pump has lots of detail. Yeah, I gotta check that one out. So, ultimate beauty, Cal, that's a difficult. Um, uh, I don't think there is an ultimate beauty. Um, I don't know. You, it, that's a f question that's more philosophical in nature. Um, Bouguereau comes to mind. Um, for example, like if you mention the name Bouguereau to any classical painter, you know they're, they're going to hold Bouguereau in a very high uh, position for his beauty and his paintings. But you ask a modern artist about Bouguereau, and they're probably going to say the opposite. So. Um, it's really, it depends on who you ask. On the topic of beauty, that's a good one. Because um, everyone views beauty differently. Um, for me, some of the most beautiful paintings are of um, people that you wouldn't necessarily categorize as the ideal uh, subject. For example, uh, if you look at Rembrandt's paintings, I think those are among the most beautiful portrait paintings that have ever been created. But they don't look like they're, you know, cut out of Vogue magazine or something like that, even though I know that's an old thing now, but um, it's, it's different. Some people will paint uh, models that are like, they look like they should be in magazines. Others will paint models that are just, you know, more human, like Rembrandt. Not that beauty is not human. You know what I mean. Hey, Montana. Thanks for joining. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Man, no beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I agree. I agree. I find beauty in very odd compositions, um, which is why I like Nelson Shanks painting so much, um, uh, along with his incredible technique, but um, his compositions are so odd, they're just different. I've never seen anything like them before, um, and um, 
just things that are odd to me are some of the most beautiful. For for example, um, look at look this guy up. Look this guy up. I'm going to type his name. He's not very well known. Uh, his name is Edward Hicks. He's from the colonial times. Look up uh, called the Peaceable Kingdom. Look this up, and you. This is for me one of the most uh, beautiful types of paintings I've ever seen, and it's unconventional. This is unconventional. Uh, I, I don't think very many painters. And he wasn't like a, a professional artist. He was a he was a Quaker preacher back in the colonial times, uh, so he didn't have the technique that say like. Uh, uh, Peter Paul Rubens had, or like, or whoever from history, um, uh, having trouble thinking of painters from the colonial times. Uh, there's Rembrandt Peel, uh, not to be confused with Rembrandt. Rembrandt. Um, but if you look his paintings up, they're so beautifully, honestly painted. Uh, they they can they can really make you uh, feel. And Van Gogh is the same too, I think, as well with his paintings. Uh, he he didn't have like a solid foundation in academ academic art, but his paintings you can look at them and you can feel them. So that's another sense of beauty. Ingrid, yeah, there you go, unique style of painting, but but don't force it, like I said, it, it'll happen naturally. Okay, so what's next? Now that I've painted the continuation of the hair, not as curly or wavy as the original, but whatever, it doesn't bother me. Um, let's say... Uh, the background now and i'm at a at a point now where i would probably bore you if i started to paint the background so i'm gonna go and zoom you back into the face and we're gonna start to paint some details into the face so uh the screen may go dark by accident if i bump into the wire because i have a sensitive wire on my um there it is it went dark but don't worry i'm still here my wire is very sensitive on my camera or the wire i use for this camera you know those old tvs that you used to have to like beat up or like smack around a little bit for them to work that's what my uh camera can be like sometimes I did say we would do the drapery and some refinements of the face. So let's see. That looks a little bit better. All right. So some refinements on the face now. Hey, John. So uh, from Menno, the self-portrait of Charlotte uh, Solomon. Oh, that's a neat one. I got to look up. Yeah, definitely look up Nelson Shanks. Call uh, he, Nelson Shanks is my superhero, uh, superhero of art. Okay, so with the face now, so many refinements that need to be done, so little time, and here's where I want to ask you once again: Are you still interested in seeing the development of this painting? Because there's many more days I would need to work on this painting to to finish it. Um, so. Once again, this is just the start, so um, let me know if we start if you start to get bored. I'm gonna add a little bit of oil or medium, excuse me. I'm adding a little bit of medium to the eye because I'm gonna work on the eye. This is called adding a couch. So uh, yes, a couch like a couch where you're sitting on. Um, so. Uh, 
add medium to the area that you intend to paint on and only that area this is called a couch canvas dancer uh, you want to see the continuation maria jim kathy good good hey randy i was the tv stop rolling person the stop drop roll Okay, so um, let me see if I can do something here because I can't move my camera any closer. But what I can do is make my screen a bit larger. It's probably going to look a little blurry as I do this, but I uh, want you to be able to see what I'm going to be doing. Oh, we got a super chat. Thank you so much, uh, Joan. Uh, I learned from just listening. Love your channel. I'm an old lady painting for years, and I can still learn. It's great. Please finish. Never bored. Oh, thank you so much for the, for your uh, your kindness. Uh, you're so kind, Joan. Thank you so much. Once again, if I had some confetti, I would throw the confetti in the air. Thank you so much. All right, so let's... Let's get to this then. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm just mixing right into this puddle. So I'm just going to reuse the puddles. And I'm going to start off with the shadow tone. Thank you uh, so much, Joan, for the super chat. So first I'm starting off with the shadow tone. Now it's time to differentiate the shadow tone, the shadow color from the hair. So it's a little more green. So I'm not shy to just use the green right from the dress. Not a problem. I see I'm actually a little closer to the painting now. And that's okay. Just don't be right up on the painting. So remember, if you are going to work on a painting for maybe just an hour or, or less and you're going to work on one individual spot you can add medium to the spot that you're going to work on and only that spot and it's perfectly fine it's not like i'm adding medium all over the place go in with this dark value so um when we return to this painting, there's many things to do. I, I call this the impossible subtleties with my students. Um, so, uh, for example, those of you that are in my online classes, you know what the impossible subtleties entails. For those of you uh, that are not in the online classes, the impossible subtleties means you get into a stage of the painting where it's not obvious where to go anymore. The further you get into the refinement of the painting, the less obvious uh, the uh, changes are going to be. That's why I call them the impossible subtleties. Not because they're impossible, but because it's, it's difficult. And uh, through the impossible subtleties, you will expand on your patience because this is going to be a very painstaking, not painful, painstaking, uh, a very patient uh, task. Not necessarily tedious though. It's not tedious because it's not a repetitive thing. Uh, for example, rendering an eye socket it's not the same as rendering a nose. There are different colors, there's different textures, there's different values. 
So it's not tedious in the sense that it's not repetitive. The fundamentals remain the same. Curvature is curvature. Plane is plane. But the way you apply them is different. Hey, David Bonnet, which brush uh, for the, the, ha the hair? Uh, for the hair, I think I used this, egg, uh, this Egbert. Uh, this is a Robert Simmons size 2 Egbert. Uh, Robert Simmons size 2 Egbert. Uh, it's from the Signet brand. I don't know if I can pronounce that properly. But just a bristle brush. Any um, professional bristle brush will do. These brushes are what make a difference, though. Uh, th these are um, pure red sable brushes. Hey Minnow, sometimes when you reach the desired effect, you have to stop yourself from overpainting and ruining the magic. All right, so here's where <laughs> I'm going to say, yes, I totally see where you're coming from. But for the impossible subtleties to work, uh, I actually encourage my students to n never think that they're going to ruin a painting. Because if you think that way, then you're going to stop. Uh, and then if you stop, if you're too afraid to ruin a painting, you're never going to push beyond. So uh, that's something to think about. I'm adding a dark glaze to the eyelid, just like I did with the dress. And I'm going to paint into it with light. So for the impossible subtleties to work, for a subtlety to happen in a painting, you have to break the fear of thinking that you're going to overpaint. It's impossible. You cannot overpaint uh, a painting. What happens is uh, you just lose interest or motivation in the painting. <laughs> oh, thanks, Menno. Hey Jim, yep, I am holding the brush more like a pencil now, you're correct. Uh, do you usually hold the brush by the back of the handle uh, until you're ready to paint the details? Yes, that is true. I usually hold the brush uh, from the back over here until I'm ready to put in uh, the details. Yes, you are correct. And so a tip, okay, so when you're doing the details like this, do not use your wrist to move the um, brush. Use your fingers. So only your fingers. Keep your wrist straight all the time. When you're working, always keep your wrist straight because if you do detail stuff with your wrist like this, you may end up injuring your wrist. So um, notice how I'm just using my fingers. And this is fun. Now we're actually turning the... Uh, we're, we're turning the form for the eyelid. The eyelid is nothing more than just a, a strip of value that has a specific curvature. Uh, uh, excellent, uh, excellent observation, Jim. You see, we're starting to put the curvature of the eye. And um, the color that I chose to paint, that dark color that I chose to paint on the eyelid wasn't really an accident. It was a warmer tone for her eyelid. In fact, her eyelids are a little more pink than the usual. I'm not sure why, but that is a characteristic to her likeness. Now the eyelid is folding into the eye socket. All right, let's keep those questions coming. Uh, the 
questions that you would like to ask the audience? I've got one for you. Uh, I'll start with one. What was the last thing you painted? And when? The last thing I painted... Uh, I'm still painting currently. <laughs> so if you're painting right now, then that, that answers the question. So remember, the question is, what was the last thing you painted, and when? So from Kathy, your husband, on Sunday. They were painting just recently. That's awesome. No, it's a portrait that uh, she, she was painting. This is from Ingrid. I painted a commission of two dogs completed a month ago. Awesome. From Maria. Teenage girl with a headscarf. Third layer still going. Awesome. So from Meg. Painted a hand holding an apple two years ago. Awesome. Totally paint with us. Two years ago is a while, so I invite you to paint with us. From Jim Adams, a mess. <laughs> Montana seascape with a church and lighthouse on the coast. Oh, that's awesome. Canvas dancer portrait watercolor sketch yesterday. Cool. So Kathy, a portrait of your husband's head and shoulders while he's holding a snowboard. So from Joan, last night I painted over a failed painting with Rublev lead white, and now it has the most satisfying, uh, most satisfying session I had with uh, God awful failure. Oh no! I have four going on now, all promising. Sounds good, Joan. Keep up the good work. Stephanie, portrait of your daughter last November. Menno, last Monday. All right, so let's see if we can come up with some questions. So I want you to 
post a question that you would like everyone to talk about. So that one was my question. All those, uh, feel free to share your last uh, painting. Hey Maria, uh, so for the uh, online critiques, I do something called a virtual classroom, which is a pre-recorded video con containing the artworks sent to me uh, through my students. Uh, these are the rules for my virtual classroom video that I offer for my online students. So let's get the reference out of there. So all online students have the ability to send up to two images each week for the virtual classroom for which they will receive at most three pointers of advice, not criticisms. All submissions will be titled critique. Uh, must be titled critique in bold. So you can keep reading this. Um, if you take a screenshot of it, uh, you can keep reading it and you can see the um, instructions for the virtual classroom video. And the uh, virtual classroom video comes out every Tuesday afternoon uh, for my online students. I also created a Facebook online class only group so students can post their artworks there so that that's the system that i use and for the virtual classroom that's included with the uh ten dollar a month uh, online class basic tier You don't have to pay per critique. It's it's all covered in the the monthly uh, the ten dollars a month for the online class basic. And I can always give you advice on Zoom too. Um, that's in the in the Zoom tiers. Uh, those are higher tiers. Oh, good question. How many brushes does everyone use? I tend to only use maybe about six, I think, at the most. I always have light and dark brushes. Hey, Carl. Oh, thank you for that comment. I'm glad it's looking nicer than the, the photo. Hey, Minnow. Uh, yes, so the, uh, the link for my uh, Patreon is posted uh, as the... Uh, pinned comment here, or you can go to the description box and and if you just click on to the, um, uh, the the link for my patreon uh, you you will be able to see the class descriptions and and such. I will make a video explaining it. Uh, right now, I only have the description written down. Uh, descriptions are written down on there, but I, I will I will create a video describing it. So basically, when someone uh, starts in the online classes, I uh, will send you the playlists containing the uh, videos in order for all of the projects, and I I have a suggested project for all beginners. Uh, basically, everyone that starts. In the online classes, I always suggest that you do project number two first uh, because it's the most step by step out of all the projects. They are all, almost all of them are centered towards portrait, but we do have some figure uh, classes now. And it's a building process, so for example, you can enter at any skill level. I have students that entered with no experience. Students that entered with many years of experience. So it's totally up to you. Yep, no problem. No problem, Menno. So from Jose, I started a portrait of my friend Craig. That was a month ago. I need to go back and finish. That's that's awesome. Let's see. Oh, we got another robot. So let's get rid of this robot. What is this, like the fourth robot I've found today?
Okay, took care of that robot. So I'm painting in the value of the sclera. The sclera is the white of the eye. The white of the eye is almost never white. It's actually a mid-tone. And I'm actually gonna have to switch into some round brushes. So I was using a um, cat's tongue, uh, cat's tongue sables. Now I'm gonna switch to uh, a round, still a sable brush. This is not one of my good ones though. What happens with my sables is over time the hairs start to fall out. Yeah, this one is just toast. Hey, Mino. Oh, don't worry about uh, not knowing much about the digital world. Uh, for the online classes, it's it's not that complicated. Uh, so once you sign on and you get the playlists, it's all done for you. You can click onto any playlist you want, and you can watch the development of each of the projects. So my online class is run through uh, demonstration paintings that are from beginning to end painted through live streams for my students to watch um, and to paint with. But it's not like, like for example, like, like this. I, w I wouldn't expect anyone to paint along with me with this because it's not a very step-by-step -step. Uh, so I, I break it down into steps and uh, for the virtual classroom or the uh, critique section of it uh, it's set up the way that I teach is set up so there's specific uh, checkpoints basically um, stages of a painting that is the uh, the underpainting, the uh, middle stages of color, the impossible subtleties. So uh, it's, there's many different checkpoints. You can also send your own artworks too. So if you're working on something on your own, I've got students that always work on their own paintings. They actually don't even uh, follow my projects. They just uh, send images to the virtual classroom and I give them advice and they get better so you can uh, use the online classes that way too in Montana you have many brushes but usually use a handful during a session uh, let's see, you like dagger brushes a lot. Cool. So Ingrid, you use a lot, but only have a lot out, but only use four to six. Yeah, I don't think, like for example, how many do I have today? I've got, uh, let's see, two, four, six. So exactly six. I don't count my fan brush because I don't really paint with it. I just blend stuff out with it okay so the eyes are like a bluish green so i'm going with viridian cobalt blue indian yellow cadmium orange ultramarine blue Oops, the hairs are falling off this brush. Now this is a very dark blue. As always, I go in with the dark first, and then I'll add the light. Hey Stephanie, can I speak a little about your in-person class? 
Sure, um, in-person classes. I haven't taught one in a while, though. The last time I taught in-person was before the pandemic, so you're, you're looking at, like, I think it was, like, fall of 2019. Um, so when I teach in-person, it is set up the same, actually. Uh, I guide students through a painting for eight weeks. The class is eight weeks, so I have a stage for each week. Um, of the uh, in-person class and the critiques are of course done in person so it's set up the exact same it's just that uh, it's only eight weeks so that's, how, that's as much time as the school will give me but if you want to come up and paint with me on Wednesdays uh, remember I, I run a portrait group uh, every Wednesday morning 11 a.m. to uh, 2 p.m. Apparently we're painting my wife, Lucy. She's posing in her wedding dress. So uh, you can just uh, just show up and paint with me. It's, it's not instructive, but I can always give you advice if you want me to. It's uh, $15 for the three hours. And it's in Howard County, Maryland. You look up Howard County Arts Council. Cal, is there a class in any other medium other than oil paint? Uh, for me, no. I, everything is in oil paint. Uh, for example, like Project 2, the one that I suggest everyone start with, uh, everyone that starts in the online classes. Um, Project 2 begins with a pencil drawing. But if you mean like pastels or acrylics, uh, um, unfortunately no, I only do oil paint. For example, figure painting we're doing with black and white oil paint. But that's an idea for the future. I'm always willing to learn and to adapt. I know there's a huge interest in acrylic. Um, I've done acrylic a few times, but I still believe that oil paint is uh, easier to use. It's, it's more forgiving. There's also water mixable oil paints if you are uh, if anyone is a little timid from oil painting just for the uh, toxicity of it. Let's mix up a brown, so red into the green goes brown. I'm very cautious with these edges. I don't want them to be razor sharp. Oh, Montana had a question. Let me scroll. Would raw umber and titanium white work for most underpaintings? Uh, yes, you can use raw umber. And, uh, for example, let me pull up... Uh, the Vermeer project that we're working on and we are using raw umber and white for the underpainting so um, remember this is unfinished so don't judge the unfinished painting this is the demonstration that we're doing or that I'm doing for um, for the um, for this Vermeer project this is sunken in so this is not I didn't paint it that light it just it has sunken in so that's just all uh, raw umber and, and lead white. But you can use titanium if you want to. And that, that's how I uh, start off with the uh, underpaintings for the online classes. But yeah, you can use that.
Raw umber is, is good because it dries quickly. Naturally on its own. So my classes build up from simple head and shoulders uh, to more complicated paintings. So uh, the projects numbered 1 through 7, uh, I also call them the numbered projects, are the easier ones for students to begin with. And then it becomes more complicated. It gets more and more complicated. But we have uh, short-term projects too in figure painting. And those paintings, those demonstrations are just one, one evening and, and they're done. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, seeing the, the, the Vermeers is the best. I'm a little timid to show the, uh, underpaintings. That's why I only showed it for like two seconds. For example, you, you'll never see me post a picture on Instagram of an underpainting like that. At least, not anymore. But when I teach, I only, um, for example, I'll only demonstrate what I expect students to do. So I'm, I'm not teaching to demonstrate to impress. It's strictly what will students be able to benefit from. In Montana. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, raw umber is a really wonderful color. A really nice one is raw umber greenish. I think Winsor Newton makes that one. I want to buy that one next. Raw umber greenish. That can create a really nice underpainting. So remember, just like I mentioned earlier, I'm holding the brush, yes, I am holding it similar to a pencil, but um, I'm using my fingers to move the brush, and I'm keeping my wrist straight. Well, I'm going to mix value per value uh, so I can get the subtlety of that transition. Instead of just blending it away, I'm actually mixing each little gradation. I'm glad that you're enjoying the figure painting, Kathy. Also, don't forget, um, everyone, uh, I do have one-on-one -on -one Zooms. So, for example, I'm going to paint with Kathy tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And uh, with the one-on-one -on -one Zooms, we paint together on Zoom just like we're in a, a painting session. For example, I'm working on my own studio painting as you're working on your class projects or your own work. 
and you're able to ask me any questions you want on Zoom. I have one slot available on Friday evenings. The slot that is available is between um, 3.30 p.m. I believe it's 3.30 p.m. or 3 p.m. I'm not sure. 3 or 3.30 p.m. Uh, until about 7 p.m. So the Zooms are one hour. And it's a weekly thing. Hey Jose, uh, thank you for your comment about the underpainting. So Barbara, working on the reclining, uh, reclining nude with the man reaching out with the cupid in it. Oh, that was the one from when was that? That was from two weeks ago, I think. Yeah, I'm not. I don't remember who painted it either. But that's what we used. Yeah, um, that one is very challenging. It's a partially reclining. I'm glad you're working on that one. Well, this crease for the eyelid is actually wider. A funny thing happens when once I start to refine one spot, everything all of a sudden looks so uh, unfinished. So next time I get to work on this, uh, we're gonna go to town basically on the uh, say the structures here for this eye, for the nose, for the cheekbone. We can spend just like the entire two hours on just like maybe one little section here. So I've got a question for everyone here, for a crowd question. Where is everybody? Uh, meaning, where where are you located? I'm in Maryland. Oh, thanks for joining, Joan. I will send you the uh, the playlists as soon as I'm done with this. Um, this painting demonstration. So check your Patreon messenger and you'll see the welcome message with all of the links. And uh, remember project two is the one I suggest starting with. We're happy to have you on board. Also John, remember if you have any questions um, now that you're on the Patreon, please feel free to ask me. Remember, uh, I check my Patreon messenger as frequently as I can between Tuesday and uh, Saturday. Ooh, those little value transitions are kind of difficult. The cat is from North Carolina. Maria uh, Redondo Beach, California. Cool. David's in Boston. Menno's in Holland. Jim Adams in Utah. Danny's in Chicago. Stephanie's four hours away in Portsmouth, Virginia. I think you you might be closer to Kathy then. Four hours away, Virginia is probably close to North Carolina. Montana Slim from Southwest Montana, but live in Busan, South Korea. Awesome. Ingrid's in Florida. Oh, it'd be nice to have some of that. Florida weather. Let's 
This is awesome. Everyone's from all over the country and all over the world. All united over the common theme of oil painting. Brian Wong, North Carolina. Awesome. Jose is in the ATL, Atlanta, Georgia. Ingrid, why do I use sable brushes? Uh, sable brushes are really nice because they're soft, yet they can grab a lot of paint. Uh, they're very, very useful for detail, for fine value transitions. Sables are the most useful for that. Synthetics just don't really grab as much paint as uh, sables do. But they're nice and soft. So synthetics were, was what I used to use before I discovered sables. And they allow you so much control because they do take in a lot of paint at once. Yet, as you're seeing here, very soft. calls in Cape May, New Jersey. New Jersey is very close to uh, Philadelphia. That's where I studied. Studio in Caminati. Let's use a dry brush to uh, blend away some of these edges. And the most beat up of brushes can be the best little blending brush. I mean, look at this thing. Like almost nothing so you can use this to kind of scrub away the edges and that's just because I don't want this to dry very uh, sharp so John's from upstate New York awesome I've got a couple of students in New York Shirley is in PEI, Canada. Oh, I didn't notice that. It's already 9 p.m. So, John, don't forget to check your um, messenger uh, shortly after this stream. I will make sure to send you the. Uh, the welcome message containing all the playlists. There's also a link to the online class only Facebook group where you can post your artwork for the virtual classroom. And of course, if you don't want to use the Facebook, you can send it directly to my Gmail. Uh, and that will be typed out for you in the, uh, in the welcome message. So you've got two ways to send your artwork to me. One is through uh, Gmail or email. Uh, the other one is through the uh, Facebook group. The Facebook group's nice because you can see uh, other students' artworks and you can ask them questions too. It's a really nice community. I, I thought I was saying John. Sometimes my Joan and my John can sound the same. <laughs> it's 9 p.m. <laughs> I'm like slurring my words, I guess, because I'm tired. I got to make sure this edge doesn't dry too sharp. All right, so some last minute softening. 
And this will be good to let dry. So the next time I continue this, we are going to enter into two possibilities. One is going to be going into the background and refining the background. The other is going to be the uh, impossible subtleties for the face, meaning all like the fine detail stuff. Um, so it's up to you if you want me to enter into the background or the fine details. Um, I'll probably start with the fine details, but if you want me to work the background, then we can do that next time too. Uh, so make sure to let me know next time when we paint. Okay, address welcome. Okay, so it is now 9 p.m. So remember, I'm going to be doing these uh, streams usually up until 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, so if you're just getting here or if you may have missed this video and you're watching this as a pre-recorded video, remember that I will be doing these YouTube public live stream painting sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays around 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. To be more specific, usually about 7.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but nonetheless, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So let's see if there are any last-minute questions. Hey, Locker125, find details. All right, you got it. You got it. Maria, find details. All right. Hey, John. You heard me say John. Okay, good, good. <laughs> and sometimes I just uh, get some words confused. Well, thank you for watching Canvas Dancer. Thanks for joining Address. Yep, so Tuesdays and Thursdays around 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Alright, so I'm going to hang out just for a couple minutes to see if there's any last minute questions. But while I do that, I'm going to rotate the canvas so you can see it with less distortion. And I'm going to zoom you out. So you can see the dress. Or I guess the clothing, I don't know. Whatever you want to call it. And I'm actually kind of lazy. I don't, I haven't been creating thumbnails for these. Uh, I, I let YouTube create its own thumbnail for these videos, so. Hopefully YouTube captures this as a thumbnail. So that's what the painting looks like so far. And you can see me here looking at my iPad. Let's just take it out so I can read the questions. Yep, yeah, thanks for watching as always, Minnow. Thanks for watching, Kathy. Excited to paint this weekend. That's that's awesome, Jim. Thanks, Cal. Thanks, Adresh. All right, no, no. Let's. See. I gotta look up the astronomist. Gotta look it up. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any more questions, at least I don't think. So uh, remember, if you 
enjoyed this live stream and if you enjoy my uh, content here on YouTube and you want to take your art education with me further, please check out my online classes on patreon.com slash artist, also listed in the uh, description box of this video. Remember, I'll be doing these public live streams on Tuesdays and Thursdays around 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. To be more specific, usually around 7.15 uh, p.m. And they usually run till about 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, usually when I'm too sleepy uh, to keep painting. So with all of that said, thank you so much for watching. I really hope that my videos help you out. I wish you the very best in all of your artwork. And I will see you on the next one.